So after um, later on today or tomorrow, just depending on how my time goes, I will send you uh, the link to the recording so that if you did miss a bit of it, uh, you can catch up afterwards. Or if you want to listen to something again or you didn't quite understand, it gives you a bit of a chance for that. We're 39 people at the moment uh, in the room. There were 100, 133 people who signed up. So we may still have some more people joining us as we go along. I will be keeping uh, my eye here on the left screen on the chat. And so if you want to uh, ask a question or make a comment, you can either just switch on your microphone and talk. That's the easiest way. I'll try and keep an eye out for hands, but that's I've got a lot of screens open, so I might miss a hand. And so the easiest way would either be to switch on your mic and just start talking, or if you just want to give me a chance to get to the end of a sentence and then address your question, uh, type your, your question in the chat. I'll keep watch on that. And when I get to a, a nice uh, pausing uh, place, I'll go back and I'll check all, all the questions that are there. Nicole, your hands up. Hello from Rida and colleagues. Good morning. Thank you very much for this opportunity. I'm hoping that you can hear me. Yes, I can. Thank you. Thank you so much. Prof, where do we sign the electronic attendance register for you? You're going to do it in the, yeah, I'm going to give you a link just in a few, in a minute or two. So I'm just waiting for you all to kind of log in and then I'll give you the link in the chat. Yep. Thanks, Nico. Thanks. Thanks for checking and thanks for being um, uh, proactive with, with that. I do need you to sign an attendance register. I'm going to give you the link in just a few minutes. Um, great. Uh, so let's start. What we're going to do today is cover 10 topics. We're going to move fairly briskly through them. Some will take a bit longer. Some of the last ones are a bit quicker. Uh, so we're going to talk a bit about international versus local journals and you know, the pros and the cons of these two. We'll talk a bit about how in South Africa, those of us who are South African will, will know this phrase, local is lekker. Uh, so we like local journals as good values in publishing locally. We'll talk a bit about the requirements that different journals have and how to ensure that you meet those requirements. We'll talk about impact factor and the various forms of metrics that journals have, which are sometimes important. We'll also have a look at the lists of journals that are available. And uh, for those of you from South Africa, we're going to focus particularly on the kinds of lists that the Department of Higher Education and Training looks for. For those of you internationally um, in other countries, uh, you'll need to kind of give some thoughts to the university or the institution that you're affiliated to. Each institution will have its own kind of requirements. Uh, we'll talk a bit about the wait time, which is the time between when you submit your article and when it when you hear whether it's been accepted and then uh, time to publication. So we'll talk a bit about these times. Sometimes journals are quite quick, other journals very, very slow. Seventhly, we'll talk about the appropriateness or fit of your article with the journal. And that's why I've given the heading on the slide, location, 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 which is a word that we use mostly for um, real estate. So if you want to put a shop or a business somewhere, location is everything. Just got to make sure you're in a place where people are going to get to you. Uh, we'll talk about sugar baby journals. Uh, we'll talk about page fees and the costs of getting your work published. And lastly, we'll talk about open access, which is getting your work published for free. And so these are the 10 topics we're going to go through. And I hope that you'll find them useful and, and practical as we move. And so uh, thanks, Nico was prompting me. That's uh, due at the end of this slide. In the chat, you'll see a request, please complete the attendance register. It'll take you to a Google form. Let me show you what that form looks like. Um, where is my screen? Here we go. Um, and here is, the, that's the attendance register. It's really just asking for your name and your email address again, stuff that you gave me when you registered, your country, uh, and then a little bit more detail about who you are, where you're coming from. Um, and then uh, do try to type your email address both times because very, very often people type their address incorrectly. And that's why I now ask for it twice because quite often um, I get it um, in one of the other, in one of the options. So that's what we'd be looking for. Um, in the attendance register. And I'll remind you a few a few more times as we go through today's session. All right, but let's get back to uh, where we were, which is here. 
and move on to our first topic, which is international or local. So this is an important question. And actually, um, somebody who attended, I think, the last meeting was the one who prompted me to put this workshop together. She was asking, how do I decide whether to publish in a local journal versus an international journal? And what are the pros and cons uh, of these two things? So I think one of the first questions you want to ask is, who is your primary audience? Who, who are you writing for? If you're writing for people in your home country, for South Africans, if you're writing for a South African audience, then a local journal is definitely the route you want to go, because that's the most likely thing that people will read. But if your work is internationally relevant, if your study is a multinational study, if you've done your research in multiple countries, then you would probably want to look for an international journal because it uh, would then speak into the international audience and is more likely to be read by international audiences. So local journals, South African journals or Zimbabwean or Kenyan journals are less likely to be read by people in the global north, in America and the UK, than they are to read uh, journals that are sort of located in the international community. And so you've got to just make that sort of decision about where you want to position your work. One of the things that I have become more sensitized to over the last few years as we've talked more and more about decolonization is the way in which we tend to allow Global North journals to kind of export all of their knowledge and their work into the Global South and we're just consumers and we just eat up all of their literature. And I really want to flip that. That comes from Nglova Gacheni's work on, uh, on decentering the global north and provincializing the global north. And this is the idea that we export literature from the global south into the global north and uh, make the people in, 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 in the global north countries uh, consumers of global south literature. Um, and so I try to publish locally for some specific issues and then other things I publish internationally. Uh, one does want to think a bit about what international means. So sometimes a journal is not South African or not in, in your country, but it's not really international. So the British Journal of Social Work, for example, is a British journal. Uh, it's primarily intended for British authors and British readers, but they, like most international journals these days, allow and accept publications from elsewhere. The European Journal of Social Work, which I was looking at publishing just a couple of days ago, is again a European journal specifically targeting people in Europe and allows papers to be published in multiple languages. And in their guidelines, they specifically explicitly say that if you're not from Europe, you're welcome to submit your article, but you have to show how your research that was done in South Africa or in Latin America or in Asia, you've got to show how it's relevant to a European readership. So you can't just publish in their, in their journal. You do have to show that it's relevant for that audience, in which case that journal is not really international. It's just not a national journal or a local journal. And I hope that that makes sense. But there are other journals that are international and qualitative social work would be one example of that. And my apologies to those of you who are not social workers. Um, I, I'm, uh, it looks like most of you are social workers and I'm a social worker, so I'm gonna speak about that. But these principles are really relevant across disciplines. Um, so Qualitative Social Work is a social work journal. It's published uh, out of America and it is open to anybody. It is not specifically for American authors, even though it happens to be located in the USA. And they are open to research from anywhere in the world. And you don't particularly have to justify why an American should read your piece of work. So you always got to think a little bit about this, in a sense, three categories of journal. There's a local journal, which is in your, in your country, and it's probably primarily for local readers and for local authors. Secondly, there are journals that are located in other countries or regions that are specific to that country or region. And if you want to publish there, you're gonna to need to make a case for why they should bother to read your work coming from another part of the world. And thirdly, there are proper international journals that are not specifically connected to a country or to a region, and that are particularly looking for journal or articles from all over the world. So I hope that that makes sense. And as you're looking at the journal, Go and look at the journal's website, read what they have to say, and see to what extent is it really international versus just not local. 
one of the things that I do encourage everyone to do, and I encourage people in the global north to do this as well, is to always include the name of your country in the title of the article. And if not in the title, early on in the abstract, so that somebody can very quickly see where this paper is coming from. There is a tendency, particularly amongst Americans, and, and, and do apologies to any Americans who might be here today, I don't, I don't have a problem with you, I just have a problem with some assumptions that Americans tend to make, which is that America is the whole world. And so they think that they can just uh, publish about research that was collected as if it's universal when actually it was collected in Massachusetts and is only relevant actually to that state. So it's always helpful to locate where your study is uh, being conducted in the title or early in the abstract so that the reader knows where it is that you're coming from. And if you were to do a quick scan through my publications, you'll see that most of them, certainly all the ones that are conducted locally, include South Africa in my title. And then perhaps the last point I want to make just under uh, international versus local is that if you are a, an emerging scholar, and an emerging scholar would be a master's or a PhD student, or someone who, who's recently graduated with a master's or a PhD or doing a postdoc, or perhaps you're a, a, a young, not a young necessarily, because you might not be young, but a new academic. So if you're a lecturer um, or just moving into the senior lecturership, we would generally classify you all as, a, as emerging scholars. You're still trying to build up. You're busy with your first you know, three or five publications. It is easier, generally speaking, it is easier to get your work published in a local journal than in an international journal, partly because local journals tend to have lower expectations it's not that we're rubbish, it's just that we're a little more generous. Secondly, some local journals, including the one that I publish, we invest a lot in trying to develop emerging scholars. So we will spend a lot of work helping you edit your work, giving you advice on how to better structure your methodology and things like that. And these workshops, in a way, are part of uh, that commitment that I have because I'm the editor of the Southern African Journal of Social Work and Social Development. Um, Whereas international journals have a much wider and larger um, authorship. So they're drawing far more submissions than we would be. And often they will be getting people with lots of money um, and lots of resources who are writing in their first language. And so local journals are often a good place to start. And so on that, let's uh, flip over to our second point. I'm seeing there's no chats uh, or comments in the chat. So I'm assuming we're good to move ahead, but do you remember if you want to if you want to put a question to me, just uh, type it in the chat. That's the easiest way. And I, I have my eye on it in the corner here, and I'll pick it up and answer you. So local is lacquer, and there are good reasons to publish in local journals. Not only because it might be a little easier to publish in a local journal. My very first publication was in Social Work by Skaplikovac. This was back in the mid 1990s. I was still a master's student and I did some research in my place of work. And I wrote up an article. I discussed it with uh, my dissertation supervisor for my master's, um, even though this was not part of my MA. He gave me a bit of advice that was really, really helpful and would encourage you as well when you're writing your first articles, get, get some advice and get some support from a mentor, someone who's more experienced than you are. And I got published and I couldn't believe it. I was, I think I was about 26. It was my first publication. I hadn't even finished my master's at that stage. And I suddenly realized I could write and I could publish. I always thought that people publishing in journals had to look like I look now, you know, a beard and gray hair and wrinkles like that. That's what you had to be to be an author. And um, this really shifted that perception. And I got bitten by the publishing bug and I've been publishing. Uh, ever since. My most highly cited publication, the one that I'm showing on the screen there with the big thumbs up and the smiley, uh, is called A Critical Review of Resilience Theory and its Relevance for Social Work. It was published in that same journal, Social Work, Matskaplikovac, published at Stellenbosch University. Uh, when I put the slideshow together about a week ago, I had 621 citations. I now have 629. I've got eight new citations in the last week. It is my most widely read article, and it is in an explicitly South African journal, so much so that it's got Matskaplikovac, an Afrikaans word, um, in the actual title. So 
I want you to just bear in mind that, you know, what gets your work published is not just the journal that you submit to, but also the quality of your work. I mean, I think that this article was, was a very strategic article that I wrote. I was writing for a particular South African audience. I wanted it to be the go-to publication on resilience in social work in the global South. Um, and it's become all of those things. I was, I was quite strategic in writing that. Sometimes I'm less strategic and I just write what I have, but this one was quite thoughtfully put together. So even though a local journal might not be as prestigious as an American or a British journal, uh, that's, not a, that's not a good reason to not publish in it. And in fact, we do want to support the development of local literature and local knowledge. Um, and we do that by publishing in local journals. So senior scholars, more kind of experienced and well-published scholars, like I am now, uh, still publish in local journals because I do want to write for the local audience and I want to develop the citations of local journals. So we do want to plow back into what we do at home. Now, one of the things that's recently been published in the journal that I edit is this article here. And as I'm chatting, I'm going to quickly type it into uh, the, the chat so that you can access this for free. <clears throat> So this is a, excuse me, this frog of mine is really annoying me today. <clears throat> this is a, an article published in the Southern African Journal of Social Work and Social Development, which I edit. And it was published by Morgenstern, Schmidt and Levier. Um, Schmidt, some of you will know, is a, is a South African who's now working and living in Canada. The other authors are both Canadians. And they've published this open access um, article called Social Work Journals, a Key Disciplinary Resource. And you can download it from our website for free. Our journal does charge for downloading. I think it's $3 an article, which is not outrageously expensive. Um, but this particular one, we made open access. What they include in this journal is a comprehensive list of all journals, pub all journals that they could find published in the Global South including non-English language journals. So they have journals that come from Latin America that are published in Spanish. They have journals from different parts of Africa that are published in African languages, uh, French speaking, Asian languages, um, and, 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 and obviously some European languages resulting from uh, colonization. And so this is a really, really helpful resource if you're looking to get your work published in the, in the global South. Now that might not be local for you, but in a sense, we're part of this broader global South community. Uh, not all of us, but, but many of us that are here today. So that's point number two as around uh, giving some priority to local journals and not, and not neglecting them um, um, simply because they're not local. Um, Good, still no questions. I'm trusting you're all happy. Just an invitation again, if you want to chat, uh, please do. It's always great to get some questions. Uh, maybe you'll have more as we go along. All right, our third focus area is about understanding and being familiar with the journal requirements of the journal that you are um, wanting to publish in. <clears throat> And what I've listed on the screen here is just a sample of the kinds of things you want to look at and know before you pick a journal. Uh, you want to know what their word count is. Some journals have a word count of 3,000 words, which is really very, very short. Many journals have a word count of about 5,000, which is also really quite short. Most journals have a word count of about 7,000. That's kind of the norm. So if you're trying to guess, you kind of work in about 7,000 words. But there are some journals that allow 8,000, 10,000, 12,000, and some journals that don't have any word limit at all. So I published in a journal called Children and Youth Services Review. It has, uh, it's an international journal on, on children and youth, as it says, on services to children and youth. It has no word count, and we did a multi-study um, uh, paper 10 authors, 10 countries. We had case studies of each country, as you can imagine. This is a very long article. It was like 14, 15,000 words. Um, and they accepted that long article. We just, there was no ways we could make it shorter without you know, seriously cutting uh, everything. Um, and so this is quite useful. You want to go and look at what word counts or sometimes page counts, right? So some journals will give you a page count, which I really hate because it means that you really do have to, first of all, formulate 
the document with the right font and the font size and the line spacing, and then try to figure out, so how many pages is that? Word count is a much simpler, um, um, a much simpler uh, way of determining the journal's requirements. So have a look at that beforehand. Look at the referencing format. Most social work journals are using the APA, American Psychological Association, version seven, not version six. Version seven has been out for several years, but it is different from version six. Um, there are still a handful of journals that are using Harvard, although that's mostly in sociology and some other disciplines, not, not in social work. Um, and some, like my journal, are using Chicago because the press, the UNISA press, which publishes our journal, publishes journals across many disciplines, and they decided to use Chicago. I don't know any other journal that uses Chicago, but that's what they use. So you always have to know what your referencing format of the journal is before you get going. You want to look at their style guidelines in terms of headings, subheadings, how to structure and where to place figures and tables and that kind of information. You do want to be familiar with whether the journal is particularly focused on large data sets. So some journals will only publish studies with thousands of participants. Some journals have a bias towards quantitative research. They're looking for big data quantitative studies. They're not interested in a qualitative study. Um, many journals will not publish small qualitative, and by small, I mean sort of 10 or fewer participants. They're looking for 60 or 100 participants, even at qual but many other journals are okay with small qualitative studies. So you've got to kind of have a look and see what the journal is asking. And you also want to have a look at whether the journal has a more practice orientation versus a theory orientation. So sociological journals, for example, tend to be more theory intensive and demand quite sophisticated theory. Social work journals generally don't. They're much more interested in data and what you found or in practice issues and implications for practice. So again, if you were to go, um, if you were doing a, a, a publication on gender issues and you went with gender and behavior, that's a sociological journal, it's gonna be requiring quite sophisticated theory. Whereas if you were to publish in a social work journal about women or women's issues, gender issues, it would probably be much happier with just a data-driven publication. So be, be aware of this all the time. Tommy, I do see your comment there. I'm going to come back to that a little bit later, just start to let you know. Sorry, I wasn't ignoring you. Um, I want to get back to um, this page over here. So this, this is the journal that I edit, and I just wanted to show you where will you find this kind of information about the journal requirements. So generally, each page will look different, so you're going to have to figure out what to do at each journal. But you're looking for something like this that says about, and then you'll see something about the journal. You'll see something about submissions, uh, the editorial team, and so on. The other thing you'll see just over here on the right-hand side, if you can see where my mouse is hopefully slowly circling around, is the section on the right called information. And there's information for authors, for, for sorry, for readers, for authors and for librarians. You're an author. And so if you were to click on that, uh, it will take you to the page about information for authors. And here, if you read, I don't know why Unisa Press does this, but anyway, there's the author guidelines. So you've got to click twice to get to the guidelines. So if you click over there, it'll take you and it'll start talking about the requirements of the journal. It's English language, for example, that we use British, UK English, not American, that the article should not be more than 7,000 words. Uh, and that is from the first word in the title to the last word in the reference list. Okay, so that's all inclusive. It'll tell you how long the abstract should be, how to do keywords, and then it'll give you information about the referencing style, which in this case is Chicago. So that's sort of the technical information, and you'll find that on most websites. The other kind of information you want to look at is the about the journal. And so I'm going to take you to that page here, because what that will do is it'll set out the aim and the scope of the journal. And you do need that information to decide whether this is the right journal for you. So let me give you a quick overview of what we're looking at in our journal. The purpose of this journal, Southern African Journal of Social Work and Social Development, is to promote and simulate research and innovation that empowers individuals, families, groups, organizations, and communities to advocate for and advance sustainable development 
and human well-being. Now, those key words were very carefully chosen by the board and the editorial team because this does pitch where our journal is. This is what we're interested in. Um, we are interested or committed to publishing, right? So this is our, in a sense, our mission statement is research that contributes to the creation of socially just human uh, rights-based humane living contexts, both locally and internationally. So we are open to non-South African articles, but with a particular focus on the Southern African region. So we do occasionally have articles that will come in from elsewhere outside of Africa or from uh, North Africa, but primarily our interest is in Southern Africa, so Sub-Saharan Africa. You'll see here also that there's a whole paragraph about research ethics and particularly about an ethics of care, a whole paragraph. It's quite unusual. Journals generally don't have such a detailed description of ethics. That's because for us, ethics are part of human rights and social justice. We want to make sure that your research complies with all of that. Um, and then uh, we unpack a little bit more in terms of what kinds of things we publish. So, for example, point three states that we will publish systematic or scoping reviews that provide new insight on new research questions, but we will not publish a literature review. So we do quite often get literature reviews submitted, just copy and pasted out of a dissertation. And we will decline that almost immediately because it's a review of what's already known. There's nothing new in a literature review, whereas a systematic or scoping review will be answering a new research question. Okay. This also provides a bit more information, including uh, the page fee that we charge. And so, Tommy, this comes back, and I'm going to talk about it now quickly. Um, and uh, we haven't increased our fees now for quite a few years. And we do have a sentence here that says motivations for fee waivers should be directed in a formal letter request to the editor. I sometimes get this in Facebook uh, Messenger or in a WhatsApp or uh, just as an email, but actually it's quite clear we want a formal letter of request because what you're effectively asking for is several thousand rand. That's what you're asking us for, is to, is to give you several thousand rand, and that shouldn't come as a, please, will you waive the fee? Um, so if you are a student at a university in South Africa, you, will be, you should be eligible to get money from the Department of Higher Education and Training Subsidy System and so we would generally say, speak to your supervisor or to your department about them paying for the page fee. But if you are a student in another country, or if you are a practitioner in South Africa or elsewhere, and, and you work for child welfare or an NGO or something like that, and you don't have funds, um, those are the kinds of cases that we are quite sensitive to. And we, we almost, almost routinely, I will say almost routinely, um, do provide support uh, for people who don't benefit from any other kind of institutional funding. So we handle it on a case-by-case -case basis. So Tommy, I hope that that answers your question there around article processing fees. And I'll, we'll talk more about that just now. All right, let's get us back onto here. So the last thing I want to say on journal requirements before I move on to the next point is that you do want to think about where you're going to publish your work very early in the process and not after you have already written the article. So I'm currently in the process of writing two articles. I, I started writing one last week and, uh, I've, and I've done about half of it. And I started writing another one this week and I've done about half of it as well. I had quite a clear idea what I wanted to do in each of these articles. It's data that I already have, it's I've already analyzed it, I know what the themes and the findings are and so I knew kind of where I was going. And so before I really started, when I said before I really, before I started writing a word, I went and thought about where am I going to publish this work? And I went through all of this process I've just shared with you now and I came up with a couple of options and then I began weighing up the options for each of them and eventually settled on the two. So the one is a very practice oriented article it's about the development of, of uh, practice guidelines for uh, young people in care, which is my area of research. And I thought about using the journal on social work, uh, research on social work practice, which is, sounds like a perfect article. When I went and read their journal, um, 
I, what I saw in the in the description in their scope aim and scope is that they want to publish uh, intervention evaluations. They want to have data on the evaluation of interventions. Now I don't have that. What I'm developing is guidelines for how to develop practice, not to evaluate a practice. And so that I immediately realized that's not the right journal. Then I weighed up between a British journal called Practice, which sounds like a great journal. The only challenge with this journal is a little bit short. It's a nice journal. I have published it once before. And the other one was Qualitative Social Work. And eventually I decided on Qualitative Social Work. It's it's published in America. It's, it's international. And the reason I went with them is because although I am writing about practice guidelines, my article is actually about a methodology, a qualitative methodology for generating practice guidelines. And so I thought it felt like it fit better with qualitative social work and they have a, a, a larger uh, page count. So I went with I went with that. All right, so just to give you that sense. So I, I do this quite routinely. Well, sometimes you, pub you send it off to that journal and they decline it. Then you have to go look for another journal. You may have to reformat your article. You may have to shorten it. That's, uh, unfortunately, that's just life. Uh, can't, can't help that always. There's a question from, hello, hello. Uh, sorry, I'm not sure how to say your name. Ramutla, promise Ramutla saying, is this, does this journal belong to the University of Johannesburg? Yes. So the Southern African Journal of Social Work and Social Development uh, is jointly published between the University of Johannesburg and UNISA Press. So my department, Social Work and Community Development, we host the journal, we chair the board, and we usually pick the editor from our department. So currently I've, I've been the editor now for several years. Prof. Leila Patel was before me. Uh, and before her was Rian, uh, Rian, uh, I can't remember Rian's surname now, and, but it's often been published by people in our department. What Unisa Press does is that they do the actual publication, they handle um, subscriptions, they do the editing, and they get it published online and um, into the, all of the uh, databases from which uh, it can be accessed by people internationally. So we quite often work in partnership like that. Um, and we find this to be quite fruitful. Thanks, a great, lovely question. Um, publishing journals in partnership is a good way to go. Um, right, so our next point, point four, I hope you're all doing okay. Uh, I see lots of you are still here, so that's great. And we still have some people leaving and then other people joining and some leaving and then joining. I guess uh, connections are not always great and that's why we're recording today's session. So our next topic is about impact factors, impact factors. <clears throat> An impact factor is in a, a very kind of descriptive terms, how impactful that journal is. And by impact, we don't mean impact on the real world, but rather impact in terms of people reading and using the work that gets published. So we don't write just so that we get something published. Actually, some people do write just to get their work published, but actually most of us, myself included, write in order that people might read what I've written and use it in practice or in policy development or in advocacy or in doing their research and taking research further or in comparing what they're doing with what we're doing here and stuff like that. We Most of us write in order for people to read um, our work. We don't just write to get a publication. And the impact factor in a sense provides us with a measure of how many people have read the work of a journal. So there's a few different ways of calculating this. Um, and the main ways are the impact factor and the site score. They're very, very similar. Impact factor is put out by a publishing house called Clarivet. And it is defined as the yearly mean number of citations of articles published in the last two years of a given journal. It's a heck of a definition. and It's like a mouthful, you have to like break it down. I'm going to come back to it now. I just want to give you site score because it's very similar. The site score is published by another publishing uh, group called Scopus, uh, which is a little bit more well known in South Africa. And it is defined as the number of citations received by a journal in the last four years, as opposed to two in the other one, divided by the number of documents published in the journal in those four years. So the only real difference between the impact factor and the site score is the number of years. And impact factors generally come out as two years, I think three years and five years anyway. So it, it kind of doesn't make any sense. 
Essentially what it is, is how many citations does each, how many citations on average does each article generate over a set period of time? So if it's two years, four years or five years, the question is on average, how many citations do those articles published in that time period generate? So if you have an, a, 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 an impact factor or a site score of one, what that means is that on average, each journal that was published over the last two years generated one citation. That means one person read and cited that article. That's not very impressive, is it? But there are lots of journals with site scores and impact factors of just one or two. And in social work, that's particularly true. I'll show you some lists in a minute. And um, what that means is that a lot of what gets published doesn't get cited. And that's obviously quite disappointing because we do want our work to be cited and used. Um, Tommy, I'm going to come back to your question uh, again, right? So, so hang on, I, I do see it there. So let me show you um, the link that I provide on the slide, uh, what impact factors look like uh, on Scopus. Uh, but before I do that, let me first of all show you international social work, which I had on the previous screen. So where would you find this information on the actual journal website? So if we go to international journals website, let me just go back to their homepage. It's published by Sage. And you'll see here at the top of the first page, the impact factor of 2.2. That means over the last two years, each article generated on average 2.2 citations. And the five-year impact factor is 1.9, uh, which is actually lower. Usually you would think five years would be higher than two years. I don't really know enough about impact factors to explain why that is. But if you were to then click on these links over here, it should take you to this page. Now, not all journals have this page and not all journals use the same language. So you very often when you go to a journal website, you have to kind of scratch around. So what I'm hoping you're doing is not writing down click on impact factor, uh, but rather kind of understand where to look for it. And here we'll see that they start off with this heading called journal indexing and metrics, and they explain what that is. And then they'll provide here the two-year impact factor of 2.2, which we saw earlier, the five-year impact factor of 1.9. Um, here they give us the equivalent from so Scopus, which is the site score. And you'll see that the site score is 4.4, which is much higher, right, than the 2.2. Um, and they'll also give you um, a Google Scholar index, which is not terribly useful. I would generally advise you just to ignore the Google Scholar. The Google Scholar citation score for your publications and your H index is useful, and we can run another workshop on that one day, but not today. Um, they do give you here the sort of full text usage, so how many readers, how many people have downloaded stuff, and they'll give you a list of what databases they're indexed in and so on. So that's quite useful. And Sage does this routinely for pretty much all of their um, journals. So uh, Benita, I'm gonna answer your question now because I'm, and that's where I'm going to next is what would be a good impact factor and site score? That's what we're gonna have a look at right now. So if we go into Scopus, Scopus is a publishing house uh, and they provide uh, these same kinds of metrics for all journals. And the way that you would get that is if you once you've logged into Scopus and you do need um, an institutional account, you need some sort of an account to log in. It's not it's not just open like Google. So they're A, B, that's, that's my initials, A, Fun, Radar. And you would click here on sources because what you're looking for now is not about authors or publications. You actually want to know journal titles. And what I've done is I've said that I'm looking in the title of the journal, not the title of the article, right? That, that's somewhere else. And I search for the word social work. Now, obviously not all social work journals have the word social work in the social work journal title. So this is not a complete list, but it'll give you just a sense of where we are. And what you'll see here in the list is that there are 59 journals, whoops, 59 journals in Scopus that have the word social work in the title. And I've ranked them according to site score, okay, which is a bit like the impact factor. And you'll see that this highest site score is 4.6, and that's for the clinical social work journal. Right? So clinical social work, which has been around for many, many years, I've published in a couple of times myself, um, has one of the highest site scores, or certainly on Scopus, has the highest site score of journals with social work in the title. 
International Social Work, we know, is a well-known international, really properly international social work journal. The Australian Social Work, which is specific to Australia, but does publish things from elsewhere. I have published with them too, 3.9. Research on Social Work Practice, which is a super duper rigorous uh, research journal. They're really looking for like very sophisticated, high level research. Uh, 3.9, I published once in them. Uh, Affilia, which is on feminist, uh, feminist social work, 3.6. So there we get, you can quickly scan down this list um, and uh, see where, uh, where, where we stand. So I'm going to keep going down and down and down. Uh, there we see the British Journal of Social Work, which is a very highly esteemed journal, has 2.6. Okay, just want, to, just want you to kind of have a sense of where we are in relation to and then if we go a little bit further down, I'm obviously not going to show absolutely everything to you, but just to have a quick look there, you'll recognize perhaps some of those titles. <clears throat> and you'll see we're now getting down to the 1.2s and the 1.5s, right? African Journal of Social Work, for those of us in Africa, has a site score of 1.5. Okay, that's a journal some of us may publish in. And then here at the bottom of this page are the two South African journals, the Southern African Journal of Social Work and Social Development. The one I edit has a site score of one and Social Work, Mats Kapelikovic at Stellenbosch has a site score of 0.9. And we have always kind of for a long time now, we've been in that sort of range. And what that means is that on average, our articles generate one citation each, which is not very impressive, but you will see if we go on to the last page, that there are journals that are even lower, <laughs> all right? So the Indian Journal of Social Work is the lowest site, is the lowest site score for journals that have a site score. There are some journals that don't, including journals like Administration and Social Work, which has been around for a very long time, um, and various other international journals. Now, some of these are no longer in press. I think Administration and Social Work changed its name, and that's why it's still here as a kind of dead journal. And the Journal of Multicultural Social Work has also recently changed its name, or may have recently changed its name to Multicultural Social Work. So sometimes that's the reason. It's not a it's not a zero. It's just not applicable because they're not yet on Scopus. Okay, it takes time to build up your your met metrics. Okay, so let's go back then to the questions from. Uh, Benita. So Benita, your question was, what would be a good impact factor or site score? I would say anything that's two or above is great in social work. Um, um, and if you can get something higher than that, and if you can actually get published on that, that would be that would be even greater still. I personally don't worry too much about impact factors. Honestly, I, I, I mean, I look at them, but I, I don't get swayed desperately by them because I'm always looking for the right audience. And um, Social Matskaplikovic, which we saw had an impact factor of 0 0.9. My article there on resilience over the last uh, eight years has generated over 600 citations. It doesn't really matter that it has a low impact factor. What was important was the quality of the work um, and open access, which we'll talk about just now. But if you're looking for a good impact factor, I would say in social work, anything that's two or above is a good impact factor in social work because you'll see that our highest is 4.6. Whereas if you go into the sciences, if you go into the hard sciences, you'll see that impact factors are sometimes very high. So let me go back to Tommy's question. Tommy, thanks, you've been waiting now for um, uh, 11 minutes. Uh, what happens if you publish an article in a journey indexed by a reputable database like Scopus or the uh, Director of Open Access Journals, and then the journal is later de-indexed? Will the article still be regarded as accredited for the purpose of applying for academic posts? Um, Tommy, that is a good question. And I know of people that have had this experience uh, with when they published the journal, it was on the list. And then when they uh, submitted it, it was no longer on the list. Or perhaps when they submitted the article to the journal, it was on the list. And by the time it got published, um, it, it, it slipped off the list. And I know that we recently uh, received the 2024 lists from Dohit, and my university provided, in addition to that, a list of about 15 or 20 journals that had been taken off the list 
uh, largely because of issues around being predatory. Um, so the sad news, I'm afraid, is that uh, the Department of Higher Education, I'll talk just now about promotion, okay, but the Department of Higher Education uh, will work with the current list. So if your journal was on the list in 2022 when you submitted the article, but in 2023 or 2024, when by the time it got published, um, or it got published and then it dropped off the list, uh, DOHIT will not accept it and will not fund it. Uh, sometimes the university may provide the funding uh, because at the time it was legitimate and so they may, they may feel sorry for you. And I know that my university has done that once or twice. Um, but quite often, uh, the DOHIT will not make the payout. So DOHIT, unfortunately, is quite strict. And so the university is more flexible not that the university is necessarily going to pay, but they may exercise judgment to say, this was not your mistake. This was something that was out of your control and therefore they'll honor uh, your payout. Um, and so similarly for promotion, each university has its own rules. So like at the University of Johannesburg, where I teach uh, for promotion, they will, they're happy to accept an accepted paper as part of your portfolio the paper doesn't have to be published because they know that there can be, you know, a, a two, three, five year gap between when your article is accepted and when it's fully published for DOHET. And so they're more inclusive, but other universities may say, no, it has to be, it has to be fully published in a journal. It's got to be submitted to DOHET. So each university has its own rules. UJ is, 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 is um, uh, I think is fairer I actually think that all universities for promotion and for performance ratings should be working on acceptances, not on publications. Because once your article is accepted, you have no control over how long it takes. I had a paper with International Social Work that took five years to get fully published. Five years from the time it was published online to the time it actually was not an issue. Um, and during that time, it counted for nothing in the eyes of my, of my university. Um, Thanks, Nico. That's great. Uh, Nico's just saying he's going to ask questions at the end. No problem. I'm happy to receive them now and I'll answer them kind of where they're relevant. Um, so if, if it's not quite relevant yet, I'll hold them until that. So Tommy, I hope that answers your question there. Let's then uh, move back to the PowerPoint. And I hope that you have enough sense of impact factors. And that leads us to the kind of ne next natural question, which is about the lists. Now, each university, pretty much across the world, will have lists of journals or lists of lists um, that they will accept as being like legitimate publications. And so if you were to publish an article in a local kind of popular magazine, you know, like um, Women's Weekly, uh, they, they probably wouldn't accept that anywhere in the world. Um, because it's it's not recognized as a as a proper journal. And that then begs the question, so then what is a proper journal? And most universities in most countries will have a list. South Africa has very clearly generated lists that come from the Department of Higher Education and Training, which is the government department that oversees, regulates, and funds all higher education and further education and training in South Africa. And in South Africa, we are in the fortunate position that the government gives money to the university for publications because they want to encourage people to do research and publish and universities make their own decisions about whether or not to give some of that money to the authors and and how much that might be so some universities may give nothing but most universities will give something and it's quite generous you can get 20 30 35000 rand uh, for a publication if it's sole authored uh, from universities and each university has their own rules so when, you, when you're thinking about applying for a job, that is one of the questions you should ask, is how much do you, how much do you get for a publication unit? Um, so the kinds of lists that are commonly used is WOS World of Science. It is probably the most rigorous um, of, of the lists. It probably has the highest impact factors journals. So generally a WOS World of Science list is quite a prestigious list. Uh, and so if you are looking to publish your work in a very competitive environment where they have like a 90 or 95 percent rejection rate. So some journals have this extremely high rejection rate. 
And that's then interpreted as everybody wants to publish with them because they are the place to be, and but they only accept a very small handful of papers, and therefore it's only the very, very best cream of the crop. Um, so that's kind of world of science. IBSS, inter I, I don't know what it stands for. It's just called IBSS. IBSS is probably the next on the list, also a very reputable international list. Scopus, also an international list, but a little bit more inclusive. You can see just from the list that we saw now from Social Work, it includes journals that are not really very high performing journals. My journal is one of those. We don't aspire to be high performing. We aspire to be an inclusive journal where people may get their first publication. So a lot of the people who write for us uh, do their first publication in, in our journal or in Social Work, and so we're happy. We're fine to not have a great index uh, uh, impact factor because th that's not all that's important. And so Scopus is kind of a, a bit of in between. So if you find a journal on Scopus, but it's not on the WAS or IVSS, it means it's a good journal, but it's not a top tier journal. If you find it on, on World of Science and IBSS, that probably means it's a top tier journal. And then there's a fourth, there are other lists, but there's a fourth important list for us, and we'll come back to this one a bit later, and that's the direct Directory of Open Access Journals, D-O-A-J, the Directory of Open Access Journals, and I'm going to talk about that later. Um, and so those are also worth looking at. There are other lists that are used in South Africa. Uh, there's a, a Norwegian list. There's a list called Silo, S-C-I-E-L-O, I think is how it's spelt, S-C-I-E-L-O. And our, in South Africa, there's there's about six or seven lists that uh, we can use. And so long as your, your article appears in any of those journals, it will generate a subsidy, um, including the list of South African journals. So there are still uh, uh, some South African journals that are not listed on any of these other lists, but only in South Africa. I would generally recommend that you don't publish in those journals because they have a very narrow readership. The only reason I would suggest that you publish in those journals is if it's a very niche journal and that's the audience you want to write for. So, and, and know that you're not going to get um, a lot of money for it. Most universities don't give you so much for just purely local journals. Uh, Betty, I just published the list in the chat. Let me send it there again. Hopefully you can see it again. Um, so uh, the long and short of the lists is find out what your university requires and will recognize. Uh, even if you're a student or a postdoc or a research associate or something like that, if you're affiliated to an institution, find out what their requirements are in terms of the lists and, and as a rule, publish on those lists. Having said that, I want to go back to the principle of local is lacquer that I mentioned earlier on, is that sometimes you may find that you want to publish in a journal for a particular reason. And an example of this was a journal uh, called Advances in Social Work. It's an American journal, and I published um, an article in there several years ago when it was not on any of the lists. And the reason I published there was they were doing a special issue on military social work. And I used to be a military social worker many years ago. And I wanted to have an article from South Africa on military social work in this collection. And I knew that I was the only person who were going to write that. And so I went, I submitted it to that. My dean was very unhappy with me, but I submitted it there because I wanted South Africa to be represented in that uh, special issue on military social work. So I knew I wasn't going to get the subsidy. I knew I probably wasn't going to get tons of citations off the article. But I made a decision that I wanted to get something in there. And so I went there. So you make, sometimes we make decisions <clears throat> that are not financially smart, but are smart for other reasons. And then of course you must do that. And then, and then, and then you live with the consequences. Don't, we don't complain about it afterwards. All right. So those are the lists. All right. Our next point is a really, really important point. And um, we're gonna spend a fair bit of time on this point, and then I'm gonna race through the last uh, four. So, and that's about the wait time. It's the time between when you submit your article to a journal and when it gets published. And I say full publication because in South Africa, this might not be true in all the countries that are represented here today, but in South Africa, a publication that is 
online. In other words, it's on the journal website, but not yet in a volume and issue. So it's one of those early publications, early view or uh, advanced publication or first publication. It has different, different names. In South Africa, most universities <clears throat> won't, won't recognize that. And certainly our Department of Higher Education and Training, the government department, won't subsidize it until it's in a volume and issue. And this wait time between when it's accepted and when it's fully published can sometimes be three, four, even five years. I mentioned one that I had that took five years to get published. <clears throat> so this is a really important, a really, really important, can you see I've got my serious face on now? It's a really important point because most people don't know about it or don't look at it. And so I wanna show you how to look for it and what to look for. <clears throat> The first thing is just to caution you, when a journal has on its web page something that says time to first decision, that does not mean time to, pub to publication or even time to acceptance. It means time to when the editor will decide whether to consider your article and send it to reviewers. So generally what happens when you submit an article to a journal, the editor in my journal, that means me, I look through every article that gets submitted. I scan the article, I look at the abstract, I look at the author, see where they're coming from and so on. And I make a decision about whether this article is suitable for our journal. If the article is not aligned with our aim and scope around social work and social development, I decline it. If it's about management, for example, or about economic theory, I'll decline it because that's not what our, our journal is about. If the article is 10,000 words, I will either decline it or send it back to the author and say, you need to cut 3,000 words to get it into our word limit. Because if you do that later, it's a different article. Um, sometimes an article is, is horribly plagiarized. And by horrible, I mean like 40, 50, 60, 70% plagiarized. Uh, then I would generally decline it and say, go rewrite your article and then resubmit. If it's just a very poorly written article, and I know there's no way I can send it to a reviewer. I will sometimes either give them a chance to revise and, and resubmit it to me for another screen, or I'll decline it and tell them to, to, to resubmit it as a new article. So that's what the time to first decision is, right? It's that time that the editor needs to screen your article and make a decision about whether it might be suitable. Um, and that's what the first decision refers to. So it does not mean that your article will get published in a month. This part over here will appear on some websites. So each journal is laid out differently, has different information. Some journals don't have this information at all. Like I don't think my article, my journal publishes this information. So it sometimes looks like this with a little uh, speedometer and it'll say speed acceptance. So 146 days average from submission to first decision. That's a long time, right? That's how many days the editor needs to decide whether or not your article is even worth thinking about. Um, if we divide that by three, that's about five months, right? About five months for that. That's a very, very long time. It should really take us uh, uh, two to four weeks is, is what we would mostly aim for. Then they say 70 days on average from the acceptance to online publication. So once you get the letter, dear Professor Van Breda, thank you, we, we're gonna publish your article till when it actually gets published online can take up to 70 days. Again, that's just over two months. Um, I used to publish with a journal called Children and Youth Services Review, and I would get the acceptance letter today, and tomorrow I would already get the proof, and usually within a week it would be online. It was really, really super quick. They're not that quick anymore, unfortunately. Acceptance rate is what percentage of articles that come in get published. I'm not 100% sure if that's articles that get accepted into the review or articles that get submitted for review, because you would think there would be some declines right at the early stage. Uh, but generally, the higher, uh, the lower the acceptance rate, uh, the stronger the journal. That means they get a lot of submissions and they only accept a few, only the very best get in. Uh, and sometimes journals will give the rejection rate, and then a high rejection rate is generally considered good. But if you want your article published, if that's what you're after, particularly if it's like one of your first publications, don't go for a journal with a 95% rejection rate because you have a good chance of not getting of getting rejected. Rather go for a journal 
with a, with a high acceptance rate and a low rejection rate. Another place that you can look, and again, not all journals publish this, but some journals will give you on the actual article, right, on the front page of the article or at the last page of the article, when it was received, when it was revised, when it was accepted, and when it was published. Now, this is less than a month. Do you see that? From the 10th of January to the 8th of February is less than a month. That's frighteningly fast. And honestly, I would suspect this journal of being a predatory journal because it's very hard to get reviews done in less than two or three or four months, let alone in a week, and then published in two days. Um, I actually think that that's a warning sign and you would want to go and check and see if it's a predatory journal. I do want to encourage you uh, not to ask editors how long it's going to take to get your article published, because the answer is it will take as long as it takes. If your article is brilliant and we can find reviewers and the reviewers agree that it's brilliant, it could take a couple of months. If we can't find reviewers, it could take several months. If it's a really badly written article and we have to send it back to you repeatedly for revisions, it could take a year or two. So it really, really depends. And it depends partly on you and partly on finding reviewers and partly on the editor, bearing in mind that the vast majority of editors like myself, we don't get paid anything for this work. We do it entirely in evenings and weekends in family time. That's, that's how it works. So we do it because we love you. We don't do it for the money and we don't do it for promotion. We don't do it for good performance ratings. Uh, it is often just not counted at all. The other thing I sometimes get is I'll get an email from someone saying, uh, can I submit my article titled this to you? I need a quick publication to meet my performance indicator requirements. <laughs> and the article is always no. Sorry, no, no, we can't. Um, so how do you check for time? You need to do your own homework. And I'm going to talk you through this very quickly, and then I'm going to try and show it to you online. You want to check the backlog of publications. You want to see how many articles have been accepted, but not yet published. If there's 100 or 200 of them, it's going to take longer for your work to get published. That's what you need to know. And so you want to know that in advance. I'm going to give you an example from a journal called Child Care in Practice. I have published a couple of times with them. They're a lovely journal. I can recommend them as a good journal to publish in because it is a practice-oriented journal and it is about everything to do with child care, child welfare, uh, and services to children. So where would we go if we were trying to find this here? It will vary from journal to journal, but what you're looking for is something that has to do with, in this case, what they call the latest articles, which is here. Sometimes it's called first, uh, uh, online first, Sometimes it's called new publications. It has different names. You've got to just kind of think and go and look for the name for this publishing house. So each publisher will have a different way of doing it. In this case, it's called latest publications. And what they list here, as they've defined very nicely for us, is that the latest articles are articles that have been accepted for publication in this journal, but not yet published in a volume or issue. And then they say articles are removed from the latest list when they are published in a volume issue. And they do also say that latest articles are citable. In other words, you can still read, you can download, and you can cite the article. And so very often you'll build up citations while they're waiting to get published. Uh, you just, if you're a South African, you can't yet submit them to Dohet. So you want to see how many articles there are in this. And I find you can manually count them, but another way to do it is just to search for the word article or report to see, see what they're called, but you'll see how they're called article. We do see the word article appearing at the top here. So I know that there's about five. And so here it tells us that there's 68 articles. Minus about five means that there's about 60 articles in this list waiting for publication. Maybe not quite that many because there are things like here where there's an extra count there. So let's say 50. And I think it is actually about 50. And that's just the first page. All right. So we go to page two, we do the same search and we see there's another 30. So let's say that's about 20. So there's about 70 articles waiting to be published. And these articles, if we go down to the bottom, you'll see that the longest waiting one was published online in August 2020, and we're now in March 2024. That's a long wait, right? Um, 
So that's the first thing. So you want to get a sense of like how many publications, and here we've said there's probably about 70 articles. So then the question is, how many articles get published in an issue? And how many issues are there in a year? So we go down here, we go to the current issue, and we see there's one. We're going to count the review. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine articles in this issue. And then I'm going to go back and I'm going to check the previous issue. And I'm going to count up again, ignore the editorial, but I look at articles. One, two, three, four, five, just five, right? So you may go through each of the issues over the year and just count up how many articles do they publish over a year. And I think for this journal, if I remember correctly, it's about 12. Or maybe, maybe let's say, let's say, I think it is, it's not very many. <laughs> it's about 15 or 20 in a year. And so if there are 50 articles waiting, then if you're looking at a five-year wait, right? Five years of waiting to get your article published. So that's a long wait. And sometimes that is how long it can take, right? And during that time, you build up citations, but you can't submit it to Doehead. You probably want to avoid this journal, generally speaking, unless you have a really good high output. So you know that you can afford to wait and you know that you're happy your work's getting cited. Um, you would probably try to uh, avoid that. Um, so I just want to quickly go and see if I can find, for example, what the citations could look like. So there's my article. You, see, you can see that it was published online in March 2022, so two years ago, almost almost to the day. Um, and it has a 368 reviews, uh, uh, views, sorry, views. Uh, but you'll see it had no citations yet. Okay, So it's not that easily ac accessible because it's not yet published. Um, So I hope that helps a little bit. I hope that helps give you a sense of how to uh, weigh up how quickly this article is going to get published if it gets through the review process quickly, right? You do want to know that because you would be cautious about sending an article to a journal that's very slow, um, particularly in South Africa. All right, I'm hoping that all is making sense. And I'm going to move on to the last few points. Many of these points kind of uh, pull together points we've hinted at before. So the first is about the appropriateness of fit. And I said this in the very first or second point, and that is look at the aim and the scope of the journal. Look at the editors and the editorial board to see who's on the board and who they are. Uh, is there someone there from your country or from, if you're in Africa, somebody from Africa? Um, that's always helpful if there's somebody that's coming from your region. If all the if the entire board is made up of Americans or British people, um, they may not be as open and receptive. On the other hand, they may be very open and receptive and really want publications from the global south. But you, it's worth having a look at that information and make sure that there's a good fit. The other thing which I typically do is that I will go and read or scan at least five or six of the articles that were recently published <clears throat> I will scan the titles to see, are they publishing work that's similar to mine in my area? And if I'm not finding anything that kind of sounds like what I'm doing, I'll go look somewhere else. And secondly, I also look at the methodologies that are described in the abstracts, because if all the methodologies are talking about quantitative, big quantitative studies, and I'm going to do something that's qualitative, then I know this is probably not a journal that's going to fit my article. And instead of wasting time, I would rather go look for something that where there's a better where there's a better fit. Izzy, I'm going to come back to your point uh, in a moment. Thank you. It's a great great question. Uh, point number eight <clears throat> is what we're calling sugar baby journals, and we see this um, when people apply for promotion, when they apply for a position at a different institution, or when they apply for NRF rating. In South Africa, we have a National Research Foundation and uh, researchers are invited to submit their portfolio to the NRF, and the NRF then gets reviewers to judge the standing, kind of national global standing of the researcher. And um, if 
many of your publications are all in one journal, that reflects very poorly on your research profile. What that means is that you have a sugar baby journal. You have a journal that you know is easy to get your work published in. They may not be very rigorous. They may see your name and say, oh, this is Van Breda. He's great. We'll publish his work. We won't worry too much what the reviewers say. Um, and they may even be predatory. And so you want to make sure that instead of having the same journal appear many times, and by many times, I do mean many. I don't mean once or twice or three times. I mean like six, ten times. Um, rather spread your eggs across multiple baskets. So I'm always looking for new journals to publish my work. And sometimes I'll go back to a journal that I've used before because there are journals that are particularly receptive to what I do. And that they're the people who read that journal. So I do want to publish there. But often I'm looking for a new journal uh, that would be receptive to my work. Avoid sugar baby journals. So look, go look at your CV. If you're seeing the same name come up many times, you are already in trouble and you do want to make sure that you break that habit. Okay. Page fees. So we're coming back to, I think someone was asking about the APCs earlier on. Page fees go under multiple names. Sometimes they're called page fees, publication fees, and quite often now article processing charges or APCs. These are charged for different reasons. Sometimes you are actually paying for the article to be published. Sometimes you're paying the salary of the editors or the publishing house. Uh, sometimes you're supporting admin staff and so on. Um, the two South African journals both charge page fees. And that means that if your article's 10 pages, we charge, like my journal charges, 175 Rand per page. So if your article is 10 pages, you're looking at 1,750 Rand uh, to publish your article with us. Um, this um, journal over here, which you can go and have a look at some other time if you want, did a kind of a review, particularly on American journals, and this is their conclusion. We find that the costs article posting processing charges range from less than $200 per article in modern large-scale publishing platforms using post-publication peer review to about $1,000 per article in prestigious journals with very high rejection rates, over 90% rejection rates. And so this includes journals like Frontiers, all the Frontiers journals, Frontiers in Psychiatry, Frontiers in Public Health, they have very high rejection rates. And I, I believe they charge about 50,000 Rand, 50,000 Rand. It's a lot of money to get your article published, but very prestigious. So you may want to pay that amount of money. And sometimes universities have, specifically universities in the Global South, will have deals with these publishing houses to uh, get fee waivers um, for countries in the developing world, but usually lower to middle income countries. South Africa doesn't quite meet that criteria anymore, but most other countries other than Egypt and South Africa, I think, um, are considered low, uh, low to low middle, sorry, low middle to low income. Um, and so very often you will qualify. And again, have a look on the journal. You may qualify for free publications in your country. Um, so I just want to go back quickly to these questions. I think I was missed one earlier. Let me just check quickly if I missed one. Dun, dun, dun. No. So Izzy's question is, if a call is out for a special issue in a journal, is the process of review and publication the same as for other articles? Y yes, usually it's the same. The differences tend to be that the editor of a special issue and the reviewers of that special issue very often are more motivated to get the issue published because it's an issue that they all, it's literally an issue that they have something they feel strongly about. So if it's about gender-based violence, then the editor is going to be somebody who works in gender-based violence, who really wants to, who's asked or has volunteered or been invited to be the guest editor. So they have a lot of motivation, not always, but very often. And... Um, very often they, there will be already a, an existing community of reviewers that you can draw on and ask them to, to, to do reviews more swiftly. And very often the authors are also keen to get their work published because they feel like if I work hard, it's quickly, it's going to go quickly. So very often authors are quicker. Not always, sometimes very, very slow and one author can hold an entire issue back. 
So the idea is that the standards are supposed to be exactly the same and the process is supposed to be exactly the same. What is different with special issues is that usually the people are more invested in the special issue and therefore things do move faster. Not always, but very often. So special issues are often worth um, considering um, uh, when, you're, when you're looking for a journal. My last slide, we've got 10 minutes left before we wrap up. So if there are any last questions, do type them into the chat. And while I'm doing that, let me also just put the register, the attendance register, please do sign the attendance register. Please don't email me. Remember there's hundreds of you and just one of me, and I actually have two full-time jobs as it is. So please complete the attendance register so that I can um, use a mail merge to send you your certificate and the, and the links. Um, Open access. So an open access journal is a journal, <clears throat> excuse me, where the readers do not have to pay to read your article. Okay, an open access journal means the reader doesn't have to pay to download your article. So you'll know if you go to many of these nice big journals, um, they will either require you to have a subscription or they'll charge you per download. So like my journal charges, I think $3 per article, you can just download the one article, $3, it's not, not an awful lot of money. And so if you have a credit card, you can do a chop chop and you can access the journal, but it's not free. Social Gewerk, which is published by Stellenbosch University does not charge uh, article download fees. So they're an open access journal. And so that's very nice because if you find an article on their website that you like, you just click download and boom, it's already sitting on your computer. You have it right there. And so because of open access being very accessible, hence open access and free, and so many of us don't have money, so free is always great, um, there is increased accessibility to, uh, to your work. And so there is often good value in publishing in an open access journal. There are journals, including mine, that will allow the author to pay an extra open access fee it's usually fairly expensive. I think in our journal, it's about 8,000 Rand, which is what you're going to pay at, at, at Stellenbosch as well. Um, and as a result of that, that then covers all of the kind of normal costs related to publishing your work. And so then art, people can download it for free. And the one that I shared with you right at the beginning today, the one on that list of journals, right, from Morgan Stern and her colleagues, that we made open access. So you can download that one for free. So what you want to do is you want to, take this little link that I put over here and save that doaj.org and it will give you a list of all the open access journals and I'm just going to show you just the first page. What I've done here, here's the uh, global open global trusted and I've searched for social work uh, social work journals right and so here they are and uh, it'll tell you on the side here if there are no charges right. So Columbia Social Work Review, no charge. African Journal of Social Work, which we know well is open access, no charge. Jour Journal of Human and Work, not quite social work, but no charge. Uh, there's a Spanish, uh, Portuguese, apologies, that's a Brazilian Portuguese journal, no charge. Uh, he has an English, Spanish, Portuguese one, no charge, um, and so on, right? Some of these journals you'll see are not in English. And so you may want to, filter them for English. I think there should be, yep, there we go. There's languages and then you can say, just give me the English ones. And so then we see uh, some of them are multilingual, okay? So this is a useful place to go to uh, and to check that there's no charge. The charge here, but when they say no charges, they're saying, are there charges for the author? So quite often open access means it's free for the reader but it's not free for the author. So you do want to check that um, a little carefully. Like the Stellenbosch Journal, Social of Matskaplikovac, is free for readers, but not free for authors. Authors pay so that readers can access it for free, but compared to many other journals, it is quite cheap. Now, I do just want to say, as my last comment, is that uh, just because your article's in an open access journal, doesn't mean people are going to read it and cite it. People will read it and cite it because it's good, because it adds value, because it says something interesting, because it's well-written, 
because um, it has good methodology and the results of findings are well presented. That's, that's what's going to get your work cited more than just that it's open access. A combination of the two is really magic. So a good piece of work in an open access journal is likely to get you good citations. And for those of us in the academia, that's definitely what we want. So um, that brings us to the end of this workshop. If the, we have five more minutes, so if there are any last questions, I'm really happy to take that. So Nico, I see your hand. Rob, thank you for the opportunity. Very informative. However, I've got five questions and I'll be very, very short. Right. In terms of your policy, how many articles is a person allowed to publish? May it be me as completing my master's last year with my supervisor? Is there a restriction or not? So let's shall I answer them as you go. So the answer is it varies from journal to journal. You want to have a look on the website and see. Our journal says that we will only have one article in the review process at a time, regardless of whether you're the first or the last author. So uh, once your article is either accepted or rejected, then you can submit the next one. And primarily that's because we have a lot of people wanting to publish with us and we want to make sure that the opportunities are well spread. Thank you. The next question, and, and maybe I missed this, um, what does a citation mean for me as Nico? Completed master's last year, wrote an article, it got published. What does it mean for me as, as Nico? It, it doesn't have any tangible meaning because there's generally not money attached to it. So you don't, you know, no one's going to pay mm -hmm. you for the citation. However, if your work gets cited, <clears throat> and particularly if those, if you have if you're not citing your own work, because we do that sometimes, we cite our own work, or your supervisor or your best friend, if, you know, if there's somebody else citing your work, what that means is that somebody thinks that your work is worthwhile. Someone thinks that your work is, um, is important and relevant and worth reading and worth citing. So there's, there's a kind of, it's, a, it's, a, it's in a sense, it's a token, it's, it's a non-financial payment or indication of value, that your work is valuable. If your if the citation if the person citing you is one of the leaders in your field, then that's even better. So I I got a B two rating this year, which is a high rating. There's only two or three so three three I think three three or four social workers in South Africa with a B rating, and part of the reason for that was because my work on resilience got cited by people like Anne Maston. She is the queen of resilience globally. Michael Unger, the leading social work resilience scholar in the world. That's, that's who was citing my work. My definition of resilience got cited by them. So that's what it meant. It got me a rating, and rating gets you some money, rating gets you promotion, rating can get you a pay increase. You know, so there is sometimes there is a tangible benefit. Thank you. The next question, can I as a private individual publish in journals or should it be attached to an educational institution? And that's such a great question. I'm really, really glad that you raised it. Um, and I hope those who are here, I hope, hope some non-academics who, who were here are still here. So the answer is, what's really nice about publishing is that we do not judge you by who you are. We judge you entirely by your work. So you could be a, a high, high school learner. You could be in grade 10 at school. And if you can write a good article, we'll publish it. We really don't care who you are. We don't care if you're a professor or a first year undergraduate student, uh, we look at the work. And I can tell you that we sometimes get excellent articles from very junior uh, scholars and authors writing their first or second paper. And sometimes I have to reject an article that comes from a full professor because it's just really, really bad work. And so it's, it's you can absolutely, Nico, if you're in private practice or working for an NGO or you're a full-time student or you're a parent, mm, Nothing, nothing stops you. All about your work. Thank you, sir. The second last question, you mentioned a lot of the, the articles do get rejected because of copying. And it's a mere mirror image of what somebody else has said. It's something that we know. It's basically just putting something together out of other people's work. 
My question is, shouldn't then the requirement of a turn-it-in report for authenticity be attached to the article as such to measure? Yes, so um, kind of two answers to that. The one is we don't require authors to do that, although we do expect that they should. So we, we, we do hope that everybody has, but we don't actually require it. The reason we don't actually require it is going back to your previous question. If you are, are not connected to a university, you don't have access to Turnitin and Authenticate and all of those other packages. Yes. So then you would be stuck. So, um, so we screen it. So every manuscript that comes into our journal gets screened through Authenticate, which is very similar to Turnitin. And if we pick up and then we read the report. We don't just work with the, the number because the number is, is not really a reliable measure. So we would then look at the report. So for example, if you did your master's or your PhD by articles, so you actually your article is actually in your thesis, and then you completed your thesis, and so you lifted the article out and you sent it off to our journal, you will get 100% or close to 100% match. But it's not plagiarized because it's the article in your thesis. And, and so I so that's why we screen, because I'll then go and look and see, okay, this comes from their thesis. I'll then go download your thesis because it'll be on your university website. And I'll just double check to make sure, yes, this actually is Nico's work. And then and then we're good to go. Thank you. And then my last question. Um, should the the journal, for example, say, thank you very much for your article. It's now gone to the reviewers. Um, yet the reviewers come back and say, no, reject this article. How is it then adjudicated? If the, if the editor says, yes, something to use, adds value, is informative, whatever, all the ticks is there, yet the reviewers come back and say, no, reject. How is it then adjudicated? Uh, it's, 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 uh, it's a little tricky. So uh, generally, the principle is that editors are not reviewers. And so if the reviewers all say reject, then the editor would reject. If the, if the, ed if the reviewers, if the majority of reviews are saying major revision, or even sometimes if one of them says major revisions, we may send it back for major revision. So We've asked the reviewer to do the review, and so we have to honor what they've said. Having said that, sometimes some reviewers um, are unduly critical, and yes. other reviewers are unduly lenient. So we've had stuff where I know this is a really poor article, and a reviewer says, accept, it's lovely, love it, so interesting. Um, and I know that it's, I, in my judgment, it's a very poor, so let me say, in my judgment, it's a very poor article, and vice versa. So in our journal, my editorial teams, because we have a couple of us people who work with me as editors and we work together, is that we try to apply our own thinking. We read the reviews, we read the article, and then we try to make what we think is a fair judgment. I generally, if, the, if I thought the article was good enough to go out on review, I would, and it, but it comes back with rejections, I would generally send it back for major revisions and give you another chance before I reject it. Um, because our journal is quite committed to develop a developmental process for authors. We want authors to get a chance to grow. And sometimes that is through giving you a chance to revise. We may still reject the revised version and say, it's just still not there, I'm afraid. Um, and we'll try to give detailed feedback so that people know why we made that decision. But we can't override the reviewers completely because then why have reviewers? We should just as well make the decision ourselves. It would be much easier and quicker. So a little bit of both. And some journals mm -hmm. will, the editors don't do anything. They just, they don't even read the article and they won't give any of their own feedback. Whereas if you were to send an article and I'm the editor, you'll see, me editing your article, me giving you guidelines on how to improve the way that you present your findings and so on. So I'll, I'll be investing in your writing because I see that as part of our mission. Prof, please forgive me. Please forgive me. Very, very last question and to the audience. If you're a private individual, not conducting any formal educational study or whatever, but you undertake a study in your organization or whatever the case might be, 
and you do write an article or you're in the field as a private practicing social work and you do want to write an article based on your findings and things like that, how does the element of the ethical clearance come into play when you review an article for publication? Thank you, sir. Uh, that's a really good question, Nikon. I'm actually not sure that I have an answer uh, because I don't think we've ever received one. So I think... Um, you know, we do get a lot of articles from students, including master's students and sometimes even fourth year students, uh, but they would all have gone through the university's ethics committee. Great. We we are aware that there also are some countries and some universities and other countries that don't have an ethics review process. And so they're not able to provide that information to us. We generally will try and handle that on a case by case basis. Um, so if there was no review done, we would be looking for a more substantial write-up on the ethics process. I mean, we want a substantial write-up anyway. We don't just want the art, you know, the study was a piece no, article in such, yes. But we may be asking for more details so that in, in effect, what we're trying to do is we're trying to assess for ourselves were the necessary protective mechanisms to protect the well-being of your participants, were they in place? Um, and in the absence of a of institutional review, we would try and provide that ourselves. But generally, since you're here, I would be saying to you, if you are in practice and you're, and you're no longer doing something under a university, either take it to a colleague at a university and ask if they would put it through a review process. So my university has this agreement with Girls in Boys Town, for example, where I do quite a lot of my research, is that any study that comes out of Girls in Boys Town that's not under a university will come to our research ethics committee. And I'll and they've agreed to do that as part of like corporate social investment, if you want. And, yes. and so you may be able to find someone willing to do that. So you now you've met me, I don't know you, but you, I guess, you know, you could send me an ethics application and say, could our, okay. could our university do this? And I would go to the chair of that committee and say, would you be willing to look at the study? It's coming from outside. They need someone to look at it and rather us than nobody. Um, that would be an option. The other option is that some NGOs and Girls and Boys Town has their own research ethics committee. And so they internally review everything as themselves. So even if you come in with an ethics review from a university, the organization will still do their own review because they're looking, they want to protect their children. And so they're going to look for, for things that an ethics committee might not look for. Mm -hmm. uh, and you'd need effectively, you'd need approval from both to do work at Girls and Boys Town. Thank you so much, Prof. Much appreciated. Thank you. Good. Good. You're welcome, Nico. I hope those uh, questions and answers were useful for others. I see a bunch of you have stayed, so that's great. Thank you for staying. Uh, that, that was some nice, interesting questions. We'll think about that for next time. I, I wish you all the very, very best. I have to rush off to the bank, and um, I hope that you have a great day, and I hope that you'll find this productive and useful. I'll get the email out to you. Uh, either later today, I've got a PhD uh, viva later on, so either later today or sometime tomorrow. Okay. And uh, hopefully that we'll see you at some next workshops. I'll be running, I'm hoping to run a different workshop every couple of months during the course of this year. And um, I'm reading the comments that you've written in your uh, um, attendance register, and I'm taking those into account as I try to think about where we go from here. So lovely to spend time with you. You all take care. Cheers now. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, Prof. Bye. Have a good Thanks. day. Bye. Thanks, Thank everyone. You.